Ever since Alaska was purchased from Russia in 1867, the issue of Native Alaskan land rights sizzled to a boil until it could no longer be contained. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971, better known as the ANCSA, served as a solution to this conflict over land rights caused by the increase in settler population, the discovery of oil in 1967, and inadequate settlement options. By providing an acceptable compromise, it has preserved Native culture for more than 45 years. When Alaska was first obtained by America, it was mostly neglected and not many settlers inhabited the land. But it had a significant flaw. It did not give Natives clear title to their land. It merely promised that Congress would protect their land rights, which, according to past experiences, was not a very reliable oath. The lack of protection for land rights was not much of a problem in the 1880s, when only a few thousand settlers inhabited the land. But in the 1890s, gold was discovered in the Klondike region of Alaska, causing the population of white settlers to skyrocket, surpassing native villagers for the first time ever in the year 1900. Commander of the Albatross spoke of his discussions with native chiefs. He said, They claim the white man is crowding them from their homes, robbing them of their ancestral rights taking away their fish by shiploads, that their streams must soon be exhausted, that the Indians will have no supply to maintain himself and family, and that starvation must follow. This extreme population growth was only matched in the 1960s by the discovery of oil, in a region that soon became known as the largest oil deposit in North America, Prudhoe Bay. In order to transfer oil to the markets, companies needed to build a massive pipeline across Alaska. However, the largest opposition to the oil industry's profitable drilling were the natives' claim to their land. The discovery of oil posed the greatest danger to aboriginal land rights, but was also the largest opportunity to uphold them. The possibility of a new source of fuel and capital caught the interest of investors and the federal government. However, the pipeline could not be built because oil companies did not know who to buy the land from, the government or native Alaskans. At the time, Alaska had recently gained enough population to become a state when the Statehood Act was ratified in 1959. But this bill contained a significant clause. It stated that Alaska must forever disclaim all right and title to any lands, the right or title to which may be held by any Indians, Eskimos, or Alouettes, or is held by the United States in trust for said natives. Although Alaska could not take lands that belonged to Indians, there was no definition as to which lands were subject to native title. Therefore, the state could essentially take any land they wanted, specifically profitable Prudhoe Bay. Faced with the threat of losing land to oil companies in the state of Alaska, Alaskan natives organized themselves to protect the land of their ancestors. There were four ways natives could have settled their land claims. One, establishing reservations. Two, earning title through the state government. Three, filing suit in the U.S. Court of Claims. Or four, resolving their claims through congressional legislation. However, many of these options would not provide a just compromise for Alaskan natives. Establishing reservations would have held native land in trust by the federal government, causing them to rely on Bureau of Indian Affairs institutions for services and limit their freedom to lease, develop, and sell land. Earning title through the state's legislature would have allowed the state to finish selecting lands first, leaving Alaska to choose the most profitable areas. Filing suit in the U.S. Court of Claims had already been attempted in the Kling and Haida court case, which demonstrated significant flaws of the court system. The case regarded the 1905 Tongass National Forest that was established on Klingit territory without their permission. Due to the efforts of the Alaska Native Brotherhood organization, the case was filed in 1935, but was not settled until 1959, and compensation wasn't actually paid until 1968, 63 years after lands were lost. Therefore, the natives were not willing to go through the Court of Claims because it would have taken far too long, and most importantly, it did not have the power to grant title to land, only compensation for lands lost. But the native tribes did not want compensation. They wanted their land. The road to a successful compromise began with the formation of the Alaska Federation of Natives, more commonly known as the AFN, in 1966. Unlike previous groups, such as Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood, the AFN was a massive organization with over 400 delegates from 17 smaller organizations. This group was prepared to form a compromise capable of satisfying tribes from every corner of Alaska. 
by uniting, they created a powerful political force capable of breaking the 400-year tradition of betrayal of Indian tribes by American settlers. The land selection process was a frenzy of uncoordinated taking of land by the state of Alaska, oil companies, and native tribes overlapping claims in a chaotic blend of blame and stubbornness on all sides. Fed up with the disordered land selection process, the AFN demanded a bill that would freeze the heated division of the state and settle the claims of natives through the natives' fourth option, congressional legislation. The land freeze bill was enacted and put immense pressure on Congress to come up with a compromise because oil companies had already paid Alaska $900 million to drill the land. With a land freeze, neither the oil companies nor the state of Alaska could earn dividends on their investments. Henceforth, Congress started to debate on a land settlement bill. Initially, Congress's solutions were not to the AFN's liking, and Alaska Native delegates began to fear that they wouldn't be paid enough for the lands lost. However, their spirits were lifted on July 8, 1970, when President Nixon delivered an address supporting Indians' rights to their ancestral lands. He declared, The time has come to break decisively with the past and to create the conditions for a new era in which the Indian future is determined by Indian acts and Indian decisions. Because the president sided with the Native Alaskan bill, conservatives were willing to pass more generous legislation in the House and Senate, providing millions of dollars in compensation and the formation of Native corporations instead of reservations. Both solutions decided the state should pay $500 million to Native tribes, but they still debated on how much land the tribes should receive and how much money the federal government should pay. The ANCSA was signed into law by President Nixon on December 16, 1971, as a compromise bill. It provided $962.5 million in compensation, $500 million from the state, and $462.5 million from the federal government, the midway point between the amount Senate and the House bills proposed. It also established 12 regional corporations, which were eventually extended to 13, adding another corporation for natives living outside of Alaska and gave Native's clear title to 40 million acres of land. This compromise has allowed Native corporations to generate their own revenue and remain independent for decades. Jeff Anderson, a former chairman of the Bristol Bay Native Corporation, describes their role in the lives of stockholders. Native corporations today under, in Alaska are very diverse. They're involved in construction, they're involved in environmental assessment, they're involved in legal situations. Out of this system, Alaskan village life has been preserved, and Native Alaskan companies have overall improved the life of villagers. Patricia Adkison, one of our interviewees, describes in an email her experience under the Sea Alaska Corporation. Some of the benefits I have experienced as a result include scholarships from my corporation to help advance my education, workshops, and training related to Alaska history and cultures. Lastly, the ANCSA largely benefited the U.S. oil industry by finally allowing them to construct the Alaska Pipeline. The official verification of this deal was agreed upon by both parties, making the ANCSA one of the most successful compromises between American Indians and the government. <laughs> Ma qui rana, nu ti la fuggia lì, e